Hey, Ken. Hey, how are you? Good morning. Good afternoon. It's so nice to see you. We're so excited the, at the ADECO Group to have the chance to talk to CHROs because we've been looking really deeply at how the whole landscape of the future of work is changing. And there's no better place to go for that kind of information and insights than to CHROs themselves. So it's just such a pleasure to have a chance to speak with you to kick off this really exciting series. Thank you. And I'm thrilled to have the conversation really interested in what you're seeing as the fundamental change of how HR and how talent in general is being used to really drive competitiveness in this very uncertain time. So it'd be really interesting to hear from you how you think the function is changing and how the positioning of that as a driver of business is going to evolve. You know, HR, I think, has always been one of the most vital pieces of an organization. Uh, it, you know, if you go online and look up uh, interviews with Jack Welch, the former CEO of GE, who's long retired, right? And he talks about HR. He said he thinks HR is the most important part of the organization. And what he outlines is that this is the part of the organization that fields the team for your organization. This is the uh, part of your organization that attracts the talent, grows the talent, develops the talent. And the analogy he uses and you know I'm a big uh, baseball fan, and he uses that analogy. He said, if you are the owner of the New York Yankees, who do you want sitting next to you? The accountant or the uh, guy in charge of player development? He goes, I don't want the accountant, I want the person in charge of player development, because that's the person that's gonna help me field the winning team. I think organizations around the world realize how important that player development piece is for their organization. How do you think the mindset of HR professionals has changed. Instead of looking to attract talent that's all ready to plug and play, how do you change the, uh, the attitude toward actually recruiting for propensity to learn or recruiting for potential? And how does that become part of your ability to attract and develop and then retain people? I think the skill that is most important when you're looking for candidates is adaptability and ability to change. I think about our organization, for example, uh, the way we report news today is very different than it was 30 years ago, right? You know, the long form story was much more popular uh, back in the day. And now uh, consumers want quick bites of information. And if you have a news organization that can adapt to these changes and, and move quickly, you're gonna have a great news organization. Uh, and if you don't, if you have people that are still trying to write news like it was still 1995, you're going to have a problem. So HR organizations recognizing that you've got to hire people that can adapt and change. Uh, it's something I emphasize over and over to students when I talk to them. They say, what's the most important skill I need to have? And I, I'll tell them, it's adaptability and ability to change. And then there's the question of among soft skills, how much is innate and how much can be trained? So what are you seeing in terms of the ability to train soft skills versus to hire for that potential? It's tough. Uh, I'm smiling and almost laughing because it's the ongoing debate, uh, which I don't accept, by the way, uh, that you can't, you know, you're either born with it, um, right? You're born with it or you're not, and we can't train you. That's nonsense, okay? Uh, if you don't have certain soft skills, if you're resistant to change, there are things you can do to work on that and to be more open to change, right? But the first step is you have to be willing to learn. You have to be willing to, you have to be willing to try. I do not accept that people can't improve on soft skills. I, I just refuse to accept that. I refuse to accept they can't improve on hard skills. When people tell me, for example, well, I'm not technical, so I can't do X, Y, and Z. Okay, you don't have to design uh, a nuclear fusion reactor. Like, you don't have to be that person. But if you're going to tell me that you can't work your computer because you're not technical, I'm going to go, like, give me a freaking break. I mean, of course you can figure that out. You know, at the, the ADECO Group Foundation, we've actually been training young musicians about how to take the skills that they've developed through the world of music and to reframe it in ways that can be heard within the world of business. Is that something that you think HR professionals are learning to do more and more, to take people from one sector, move them to another, from one area of expertise, move them to another? How do you do that? And what kind of skills do HR people need in order to unlock that talent? 
first you have to just be creative. You have to, you can't sit and think in a box. I'll give you an example. We at, at Bloomberg have a large customer service function, okay? And a lot of it's technically oriented in terms of giving technical support to our customers. So for years, um, we would look for people who had technical skills to provide that. And then it occurred to us, you know, that customer service skills and being able to work with a customer are really important. And one day, uh, and I'll take credit for this, uh, I was in the hotel at Cornell University. They have a hotel school there, right? And the students work in the hotel and they study hotel management. Uh, and the service they provided was so extraordinary. It was like a five-star hotel, uh, the service at least. And, and I was made. So I would talk to the students and I go, you know, how did you learn to give great customer service? Why do you work here? And they said, well, it's part of our studies that we work in the hotel and we uh, give great customer service because that's what we're taught. You know, that's part of the hotel business, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would talk to them further and say, well, what do you want to do when you graduate? And it occurred, and I learned that, yeah, most of them want to work in hotel management, but some of them don't. Some of them don't. Some of them are like, okay, after four, three or four years of studying hotel management, this is not what they want to do for the rest of their life. And, and then I started pitching, hey, would you be interested in working for Bloomberg? And this was a very non-traditional role for us because to have someone who studied hotel management work in technical support for our customers is not quite the match that you would think, right? And uh, so we tried it. We started hiring some of them and they did amazing. I think we have to be creative in thinking about people and, and what they've studied and what they can do. We also have to be creative and say, look, you know, not everybody goes to a four-year school and we have some great people that that haven't gone to a four-year school and and are phenomenal. Looking at non-traditional backgrounds is a great way to find great talent. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, how do you actually tap into a much broader talent pool, not just to tick a box for DEI, but really to look at how you find the people with the skills that you need and kind of deploy them wherever they are. So what, what are your thoughts and what are you doing at Bloomberg to, to pull in more diverse, really untapped pools of talent? When you talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, the inclusion piece is about having an environment where everybody can be themselves and bring themselves to work uh, and feel very comfortable and supported. Because if you don't have that, you're not gonna get talent in. People are gonna look at your organization and say, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna be comfortable there. I don't think I'm gonna wanna work there. So the inclusion piece is critical uh, to have the right environment. Uh, but in terms of tapping the tools of talent, it goes back to the other things we were talking about in terms of skills. Uh, companies have to be open to people from different uh, backgrounds and different skills backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, uh, because uh, if, you, if you're not, you're not gonna get diverse talent coming into the company. If you sit there and think, well, let's say in engineering, you have to have a computer science degree to be in our engineering department. Well, okay, you're gonna get the diversity of the computer science departments. That's all you're gonna get. You're not gonna get a broader diversity that's available. However, if you're willing to look at people that go to uh, computer science boot camps, right, that studied English perhaps, and then after they graduated, decided to just pick up their skills and go to a boot camp and learn computer science, not by getting a four-year degree, but by doing a different method. Again, you'll begin to diversify more um, than you would have otherwise. And I think it's that idea of agency. People need to have a say in how they build those careers and how they go and get those skills that's really important. So those are some of the things that we're going to be picking up at Fuse. So that interplay between individuals and organizations, between HR and competitiveness, how companies are playing a role in the world and impacting society. All of that's going to be a really exciting and dynamic conversation coming up on the 30th of September. So we hope to see you there with us and be able to continue this conversation and this has been truly such a pleasure Ken thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us my pleasure and I look forward to it